Good news of the day. Jesus Christ died for our sins and has given you eternal life. He loves you infinitely and wants you to join him in eternal life in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit. You are valuable and important to him and you have great worth in his eyes. If you're struggling or going through something difficult, you will get through it. You are strong. Jesus loves you and is with you. He is ready to be accepted into your heart at any time. Ask for forgiveness for your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you will be saved. Please know how loved and special you are and how you are an irreplaceable child of God. Stay strong and take care of yourself. By the time this video comes out, Natlin will be out and we will all be playing it. Whether it will be good or bad is still to be seen, but I'm going to talk about something that everyone's already forgotten about because I want to. <laughs> so on that note of things that everyone's already forgotten about, are we ready to accept that the summer events just aren't good? We've only had four summer events and three of those four have been pretty bad. Varying levels of bad, but like none except the first one are really good. So I feel like I used to say, oh, the summer events have gotten bad. But I feel like it's more appropriate now to just say the summer events are bad, like in general. Now, I would be lying if I said that when I saw the poster and stuff for the summer event this year, I had hope for it because like that would be a lie. That would be wrong because I really didn't have any hope for it. I saw the poster and I saw Nilu, queen of the most interesting and well-written characters. Navia should be compelling but isn't. And Karara, who is literally a happy-go-lucky Amazon delivery woman, and Scaramouche in the poster. And I just thought... You can't write a good story with that combo. There's no way. <laughs> now, that actually, of course, technically isn't true because, of course, a talented writer can actually, you know, um, make a good story with just about anything. But let's be real. It'd be pretty hard because you basically have Scaramouche and three blank pieces of wood to make a to make a story with. So you basically have to write three new characters so that was one of the reasons I thought it was doomed from the start because the best part of the past summer events, really just the first two because everyone in the third acted like blank ass pieces of wood, um, but the first two summer events, the best part was the character interactions. They were very funny and interesting, kind of off the wall, characters that don't normally get a chance to interact with each other. And that's where the bulk of the enjoyment of the first two summer events came from. Since the plot was kind of little to non-existent, it was just a flimsy excuse to get our collection of oddballs out to like a tropical paradise locale, which is like fine. Like I could have personally used a little more plot, just a crumb would do, but like I'm fine with character stuff too. Um, as long as it's well done. And especially in the first event, like the first summer event ever, I really thought everyone was really well written and it was really funny and charming and interesting. That being said, how, if, if, if the, if the summer events succeed because of interesting and funny and charming character interactions, how could this one ever hope to succeed in the first place when three of the characters that are being brought along are effectively just the same character? Nilu is happy and nice. Navia is happy and nice. Karara is happy and nice. Yeah, all the girls have different designs, different occupations, they have different countries of origin, but that's like none of those are personality traits. And when you boil down the biggest, most important aspects of their character, they're all the same person. <laughs> all of them are positive, all of them are helpful, all of them are pleasant and kind. I've played through this entire summer quest against my will. I've even played the world quest with no voice acting weirdness that they just threw in at the end for no real discernible reason that I can tell. And there's no one distinct action that Nilu or Karara or Navia takes that I feel like none of the other girls in that trio would have done. Example, Nilu helps the origami animals in trouble in the forest. Navia would have done that. Navia is patient and helps the toy people of the city find the courage to pull the switchy thingy. Nilu would have done that. Karara helps us out near the end of the quest by saving us when we were falling. Navia would have done that. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? The girls are interchangeable with one another. They are all effectively the same archetype. Bubbly, pretty, and nice. Why on earth the Hoyo writers thought that putting three of their blandest girls, who all have virtually the same personality, in one quest together was a good idea, I will never understand. 
their writing choices to this day baffle my mind like 24 7 and it's also baffling because this problem could have been really easily solved by keeping one of the girls, let's say Karara, because she hasn't got a lot of screen time, and replacing the other two girls with girls of more varying personality types, say, add Kujo Sara and Kokomi, and there you go, you got Karara, Kujo Sara, and Kokomi. Or you could have kept Nilu and added Jean and Sucrose, or, you know, keep Navia and add Lynette and Raiden. The point is, Genshin has a lot of female characters to choose from, so the fact that the writers picked three that are, yes, essentially the same character is just mind-numbingly short-sighted. I do not know why they did that. And it also glaringly draws your attention to something that they should be desperately trying to divert your attention away from. The choice to bring the three girls who have such criminally similar personalities makes you confront at point-blank range, and I mean literally they put it right on display in front of you, how weak the writing of their female characters actually is. I just told you they wrote the same character like three times over, and if you add in some of the other bubbly, nice, happy girls like Yoyamiya, Charlotte, and Shanglin, we can bump that number up to six times. The Hoya writers wrote the same character six times. They also write the other archetypes for waifus over and over again. They got the overworked waifu archetype, Jean, Ganyu, Kokomi, Kaching. They got the girl boss, hot lady, Yuland, Clorand. Ar Ar Arcalino or whatever the child groomer arguably Raiden Shogun they just the Hoyo writing for female characters is really weak and it's honestly embarrassing when you lay it out like that some of the girls are literally just boiled down to their occupations they basically don't have personalities Yanfei lawyer Charlotte reporter Shanglin chef Nilu, dancer, Yunjin, opera singer, so on and so forth. It's low-key pathetic how bad the writing is for some of these ladies. Like, when you think of them, you don't even think of their personalities. You just think of their occupation because that is how mm, rich with depth they actually are. Now, because someone's going to complain in the comments, maybe, there are a few, not many, but there are a few female characters that are well-written in Genshin, okay? Not all. Hashtag not all. Um, Nahida, Shenha, and Shevrus come to mind as a few of the well-written ones, but on the whole, I think that area of the Hoyaverse writing needs a lot of work, in my opinion. I don't know if they need to hire more female writers, or they just need to hire better male ones, because, yes, obviously, a male writer, if he's, you know, actually good at his job, can write a perfectly great female character if he, you know, tries to and cares to, but regardless, something really needs to change in that writing room upstairs, because as it stands now... I know that the female characters in Genshin, most of them are going to be about as in-depth as a sheet of paper. That's just par for the course at this point. The game's been going on for four years, and it's been more or less consistent on this front since the beginning of the game. Again, not all the female characters are bad, but I would just say on the whole, I do believe they're more often flat, one note, and uninteresting compared to their male counterparts. Now, just so nobody gets their little bonnet in a twist, not all the male characters are fantastically out of this world, amazing writing achievements either, but I would say with complete conv conviction that they on the whole are more varied, more complex, and they have more interesting backstories and are not just reduced to being their career. The only male character I can think of as being particularly badly written is Toma, to be honest. The rest, I think, are all pretty solid characters. I hate Alhatham, but that doesn't have to do with his bad writing. He's just a horrible person. So honestly, other than the abomination that is Toma, I think the male character writing is pretty good. Um, so that's my first main complaint about this year's summer event is that all the girls have the same boring ass personality. And why did they choose three that are so similar and they need to up their writing character writing for the female characters in their game? And speaking of that, changing gears a little bit, does anyone know what Wanderer's character is now? Listen, I'm not coming for your boy Wanderer mains. I love him. He's my vice main, whatever that means. He's basically my main, but because he's so much stronger than Kaya, but like, don't tell Kaya that. Anyway, so like this hat wearing weirdo, he went from supervillain to broken shell of a supervillain to receiving kindness from Nahida and Traveler and wanting to repay his debt to them and being like, a totally not crazy supervillain anymore and I liked all that and I was following but like I'm not following is this man a saint now I'm not joking 
remember in the Inner Darshan Championship rewrite video I did? Um, if you haven't, please go watch it. Uh, it's really good. Anyway, um, <laughs> I basically talked in that video that I did about how I felt like Scaramouche giving Tainari his water was a tad bit out of character because I felt like it was too kind too quick. I mean, this man was trying to make himself a god and usurp an entire nation like two months ago or something, and now he's like this water-giving saint. Like, okay, sure game. But it really wasn't that bad. Scaramouche was mostly in character in that quest. He was his usual arrogant, mushy self. But like now, after this summer sugary sweet monstrosity of a quest, I'm wondering what his character even is. <laughs> And I don't mean that sardonically either, like, is he just a saint now? Like, are those therapy sessions that he that makes him go to actually working? Because in this one quest alone, and like shoved into one chapter, mind you, Hat Guy, I hate that title so much, like, what was the point of even naming him when no one ever calls him his name? You tell me, Hoyaverse. Scaramouche saves our life, Navia's life, Milu's, and Wheels. I think that's the toy man's name, but I don't care enough to check. And then... He also, he saves our lives multiple times within this one chapter, at least twice. And then he calls the Traveler adorable, which felt out of character. And I don't know if that line about being adorable is Scaramouche being mocking to the Traveler or not. But Patrick, his English VA, seemed to play it more on the sincere side, which like, I don't blame Patrick for his performance being a little saccharine when like probably poor Patrick doesn't even know what Scaramouche's character is supposed to be at this point. So... The point is, I felt like the delivery of that line was more on the sincere side than mocking, which, like, was odd. Like, in my opinion, I don't think Scaramouche, in all the characterization he's received up to this point in the story, is really the kind of guy to call the Traveler adorable. Like, and mean it. Like, it's weird. You know what else is really freaking weird? He puts us in Nilu's lap for some reason. Like, fan service is the real reason, but, like, what's the canon reason? Why? Why did he not just, like, put us on the ground? It makes no sense. Unless Mushi's really become such a saint that to see his dearest, most precious, and treasured companions, most gentle and delicate head lay upon mere soil, that would just destroy his innocent, earnest, delicate heart to a billion shreds. Like, what? That's just dumb. It feels very out of character, and that whole scene where he puts us in Nilu's lap is just weird. He cooperates, no, he literally leads the charge in going to fight the dragon, but then he is the first to take lead in advocating for the dragon when he realizes that, you know, Durin's not, like, a complete monster and he has this, like, ooh, sad boy backstory. And Scaramouche has a feelings jam with Durin, telling him he's not gonna hurt him and that he's safe here and all this jazz. And I'm just like, damn, the therapy worked. He got off screen, that therapy really worked. Nahida got, like, a miracle worker up in here. Now, I'm not making fun of people who are kind or saintly. Having a character be heroic and kind and in touch with their feelings is totally wonderful and awesome and can make for a super awesome, likable character. Think Deku or Umaraka from My Hero. But, like, that's not Scaramouche. Now, I'm not opposed to Scaramouche becoming saintly, but I'm just mad it happened off screen. I mean, I keep joking about the therapy, but that's my only real explanation for how this radical transformation could have possibly taken place. I mean, do I have to remind you guys that Scaramouche did in the past, like, commit mass murder? Like, I know it's not something the game dwells on, and as a Scaramouche fangirl, it's not something I really like to dwell on either, out of sight and out of mind and all that, but, like, it is a canon part of his character. All those sword makers and in Inazuma from the different sword making clans, yeah, he literally killed them all. The different members of the Raiden Gokuden, Scaramouche didn't even know most of those people. They weren't related. They were just related to somebody who hurt him, I think, or like a swordsmith who hurt him or who was his friend or something. I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember the confusing lore. So I think what happened was that I'm doing this for myself. Okay. Um, Scaramouche thought one of the swords making people killed his friend who was Kazuha's ancestor, but it was really Aldo Tori, but he didn't know that, obviously. So, like, the Raiden Gokuden people were just, like, he saw them as being related to his friend's killer, who had also been his friend, and I think he thought it was a betrayal, or that's how he saw it or something. So, sorry, I don't remember all the details clearly, but it's been a long-ass time, and I can't find a clear summary of his lore on any of the wikis, so... Just know, this man killed so many people. And honestly, his reasons don't really matter that much. He killed so many people. And he killed them with a sword. Like, Scaramouche saw the lights in their eyes fade as he killed them. That's just canon, okay? Sorry, Scarif fangirls, but, like, it's true. Our boy did some super effed up stuff in the past, okay? Like, just straight up evil. 
And I know that as the Wanderer, he didn't kill those people in this timeline, for lack of a better word, but he still remembers killing all those people. So he even claims responsibility for it in his voice lines and at the end of his Sumeru Archon quest where he becomes the Wanderer. So yeah, point is, Skara is pretty messed up. This is the same man who enjoyed slapping his subordinates for fun. Like, that was canon. Still is. He likes slapping the crap out of people. So that's a thing. Or, like, it, he liked to do it in the past is what I meant. That was canon. It still is canon. Like, ugh, you know what I mean. So now the slap-happy mass murderer has feelings jams with Lego dragons and shushes them quietly and tells them that they're safe now because he would never hurt them and he wants to be their friend. I really feel like an a-hole writing this. Like, Loki Elder Tori is actually writing this video essay making fun of Mushi trying to better himself and live a better, more moral life. But, like, I swear, I'm not opposed to any of that. I really am not. I love Scaramouche, like, too much. He is literally the cutest bean ever, and I just want to marry him, okay? So, of course, I want him to be happy and grow and to be a more moral, more virtuous, and joyful person. I just think his character has changed a lot too quickly and mostly off-screen is what I'm saying. Like, a good example is like one of Ma Sucrose's main things about her is her shyness. And if she suddenly appeared and was super brave and extroverted, I would have questions and concerns about how fast that change was and that it all happened off screen. I feel like that's bad writing and I don't even feel that way. I know that's bad writing. And this is effectively the same thing that happened with Scaramouche. Mushi did change after being helped by Nahida and the Traveler. He changed after his failed suicide attempt. He changed after realizing that he had been groomed and manipulated for the majority of his life. So yes, obviously he's changed a lot, but I still feel like I would have liked to see more of the steps from point A to point B. I feel like we skipped all those steps and now he's just basically a saintly Sundre hero is what he is. Like I think Shadow the Hedgehog is actually way more edgy than Scare at this point. Like Scare is now a single dad to a dragon baby and like that's never the direction I would have expected his character to go in. Like, that's never a sentence I thought I would have to write ever. But this is the timeline we live in, so. And the funny thing, too, is I actually, because I have too much free time and too much mental space devoted to this terrible gotcha game I keep playing for some reason, I've actually dreamed up a kind of similar plotline for Scaramouche's development because, you know, I actually wanted to see him develop rather than just having him go through tons of character development off screen and never see it. <laughs> I don't know. What a crazy concept. So basically Scaramouche's trauma does stem from his childhood and so I thought of a plot line in my mind where he basically slowly begrudgingly befriends this small Eremite boy at an orphanage and the plot line would start with Nahida telling him he has to go help at the orphanage with something maybe to repair something high up because he's the only one that can fly and he does this begrudgingly not happily because he lives in Nahida's basement. So he does this, and while he's there, he encounters this very belligerent Eremite boy who doesn't get along with the other kids at the orphanage. And upon their first meeting, him and Mushi would probably get into an argument or something like that. Anyway, I won't go into the whole fanfic rewrite right now, but basically know that Scaramouche and this kid would slowly bond, and Scaramouche at some point would find out that this kid had been abandoned by his parents at the orphanage just like he was abandoned, and maybe the kid is in denial about his abandonment, or the kid's just really troubled about said abandonment, so that's why he doesn't get along with the other kids. And in this belligerent, foul-tempered boy who's really just sad and hurt and angry, Scaramouche sees his younger self. And he's able to begin to reflect on who he was in the past and who he is even now and come to understand his own feelings a little bit better, understand that a lot of his rage actually comes from hurt. And in doing so, he also learns compassion and humanity for another person. And, you know, throughout the quest, he grows very attached to this boy and eventually ends up doing something very selfless to help him. I actually thought maybe at the end of the quest, Scaramouche could adopt him or something like that. And it would be kind of strange because, because you know, Scaramouche as a dad would be strange. Um, but I feel like that could really be a big moment for his character. It could be a very big heroic moment where Scaramouche pronounces, I'm never going to make this child feel unwanted the way that everyone in my life made me feel unwanted. And it could just be a really beautiful story about a broken man learning to put others first and learning that he can help a child that's suffering in the same way that he had suffered in his own past and be that person to reach out to this innocent child, be that person he wished he could have met when he was suffering as a child, and no one was there to reach out a hand to help him. And I feel like that could just be a really mature, nuanced, and good emotional story. And the strangest part of all of this, going back to what we actually got, is that we got something in only some vague way similar to what I thought up. But 
but instead of a small troubled Aramite boy, it's a Lego dragon. Scaramouche befriends. And it's not really the same. It is the same in the most basic facts that there's this innocent child, basically, that Sierra befriends because Durin acts and behaves like a child, which I find weird because how long has he been in Simulanka? But anyway, I don't know. But he's clearly a child. And so you kind of have the same core idea of Scaramouche being kind to this child and becoming more heroic to help a child. So that idea is the same at its base. But you're kind of missing all the parts where Scaramouche actually learns to do this and becomes a better, more thoughtful person. Instead, in this quest that we actually got, Scaramouche is already right there, ready to help Durin from the beginning. I mean, as soon as Scaramouche realizes that the dragon isn't all bad, he sees some of his memories, Scaramouche is already feeling pretty upset, and he feels a lot of empathy and sympathy for Durin right away, and Scaramouche is super eager to jump in and comfort him and all this sweet stuff. And, you know, that is sweet, and that's nice, but it's just, I'm just shocked that Moosh is so emotionally ready to, you know, be vulnerable like that and to comfort a complete stranger like that. And, like, don't get me wrong, it's nice. I just wish I had seen more of his development from when, you know, he was more harsh and arrogant and selfish in the past to become someone who is so selfless and willing to help others and willing to provide pretty extensive emotional support to others he met, like, two seconds ago. So I'm just going to kind of leave that thought there. You understand my feelings, I think, I hope. And again, just to reiterate, I'm not opposed to Scaramouche becoming saintly at all. I'm just more shocked that he's already so virtuous and we weren't allowed to see any of that development that led to him being like this now, becoming this amazingly saintly person. And you can headcanon all day long. You can be like, oh, you know, Nahida does feeling jams with him every night and her kindness melted his heart of ice and she's such a good mom to him and stuff. And of course, she is a great mom to him. And we can imply as the audience that his extreme radical change of heart has had to do a lot with Nahida's very kind and nurturing influence. But at the end of the day, all of that is just writing the story for the author. We weren't given access to any of that and we don't even know if that really happened. It is a reasonable assumption to make, probably, but we're honestly given very few Nahida and Scaramouche interactions to begin with, so we're just kind of making up stuff so that it makes sense. Just, again, writing the author's story for them because they were too short-sighted to do that for us, even though that's their job. So we're just going to leave that there, I guess, but I do wish Scaramouche's character development was done better, like my boy deserves better. Let's talk about some other stuff. I call this section the goof that goofed too goofy. And basically it means I don't like all the little kid stuff. The talking animals, the talking toymen, the Lego dragon. It's all well extremely childish and well it's goofy, it's ridiculous, and yeah it's kind of dumb. Now kids would love this stuff. Eat it up. And good for them. But I'm a grown ass woman and like I'm not. I think this is a pretty great way to express my feelings. So, Princess and the Popper Barbie movie. Has anyone else seen this masterpiece? If not, go watch it right now. Pause my video. Go watch it. It was by far my favorite movie as a kid, and I just watched the crap out of it over and over again. And now the story is mostly a high-stakes drama involving humans. There's kidnapping, plots to take over the kingdom, pretending to be royalty, oh, attempted murder. It's so good. Still holds up to this day. It really went hard for no reason, and I loved it. Anyway, it also has talking cats in it. So the cats like occasionally do help advance the plot, which like I appreciate, but mostly they're just window dressing to help sell toys to cute kids that like talking cats. And as a kid, I loved the cats. They were probably one of my favorite parts of the movie. But as I got older, the cats kind of grated on me and I think they were by far the worst part of the movie and they do distract overall from the main plot and kind of mess with the tone a little bit. Now, in fairness, they don't ruin the movie or anything, and it was a kid's movie, so it is important that it appeals to kids because that's its main job. And as a kid, I love those cats, so they're perfectly fine. But as an adult, I found it a little harder to take the struggles of the talking animal seriously. It always felt really goofy, basically. Now, it's one thing if the whole world is talking animals. A good example of this is Zootopia. Everyone in that film is a talking animal, and the movie takes itself seriously and the plot seriously, and so I could really find myself relating to and getting invested in Judy and Nick's problems and emotional struggles. 
But it gets a little more like weird and immersion breaking when talking animals and people are in the same world. A good example of this is Alvin and the Chipmunks live action movies. The CGI chipmunks talk to the human live action actors and like it's goofy, right? Like it's hard to it's hard to take seriously. Like, those movies are really goofy. That's my point. When the origami animals are talking to Nilu and Traveler, I'm just like, why are we here? Just to suffer? And when the game is really trying to make me feel invested in the conservative toy man's fears that without the magic protecting them in their city, they will literally die. And Navi is consoling them. I'm just so distracted by the fact that they are toy men. I mean, the whole scene is ridiculous. Imagine if everything in the quest was the same, except all the talking animals and talking toy men were replaced with human NPCs. I feel like that would already make a huge improvement in making the story, like making me give more of a crap about it. I'm sorry, maybe I'm just old, but it's hard for me to really care about some goofy looking origami creature or toy man dude I met like two seconds ago. Now, I do think this complaint of mine is more subjective than my first two, which I honestly feel like I tried to be pretty objective, okay? I feel like this complaint is kind of a little bit personal taste because I personally find it quite challenging to care about the talking animals and inanimate objects. But I also feel like maybe I'm onto something here and maybe it's not just personal. And even if it is just personal, hopefully there's some other of you that felt the same way. I also felt like one way that this was also a bad choice was making them be like physical things like paper and toy stuff. Like having them literally be made out of that stuff. It gave those NPCs a real artificial feeling to them especially the toy man, I feel. So when they're debating their feelings, I'm just like, why should I care about them? Aren't they just toys? I mean, they aren't real, right? And at the end of this quest, we find out the answer that yes, they are real, sort of, but their physical appearance just felt so goofy and childish that it made it hard for me to get into their heads and emotions. So it could have just been a me thing, but Simulanka's goofiness wasn't really for me, and that leads smoothly into my next point. What the heck is Simulanka? This is never well explained, like, at all. I'm going to tell you how I understood it. Ready? Okay. If this makes no sense, blame Hoeyverse, not me. So a long time ago, three witches from the Hexen Circle basically decided, for reasons we're never privy to, to make a fairy tale world inside a physical picture book or maybe multiple books. It's not really clear on that. And within this world, the beings are all sentient and they have their own feelings and thoughts and ideas and stuff. The beings in this fairy tale world can also, with help, go to the real world, but they turn into other forms there, like the origami animals become real animals and the toy men become physical objects that can't move, which is horrifying, by the way. Mini Durin becomes something else when he goes there because because we're not really told. Anyway, we know that Mini Durin becomes something very small because in the bonus little bit of dialogue between the sweet single mom and her emo angsty had obsessed teenage son, Durin is small enough to hide on Scarra's person without being spotted by Nahida. So maybe Durin became like a lizard or something. I, I don't know. Anyway, but in case you weren't following, let me give you some more wonderful details that really just clear up everything about Simulanka. Okay, so in this fairy tale world, which should just be like a different dimension, I would think, because you can access it through any copy or at least numerous copies of the same fairy tale book, but it's not a physical different dimension space because that would just make too much sense, I guess. We know it's not a different dimension and touching the book doesn't just teleport you there because near the end of the quest just kind of randomly thrown in there, there's this part where the toys start going through the next page of the book and this is bad. And that's what causes the titanium mines to be destroyed, but I don't really know what that means. So basically, does that mean that all of the world of Simulanka is on a single physical page of a physical book or multiple books? Like, what, is, what, what does that even mean? And why would going on to the next page destroy that part of their world? Because unless the book is a collection of short stories, that should still be in their universe. <laughs> I could understand if like trying to leave the book, like they were on the last page and then they tried to go beyond it, like maybe that would do some damage to their world because maybe they're limited to the fairy tale book world or something. But like, why would going on to the next page cause so much destruction? That literally doesn't make any sense. And also I'm struggling to understand what going on to the next page even means. And I'm kind of thinking of it like 
maybe it works like the map in Tavat. Like, if you go too far, Paimon tells you to turn back. Like, maybe it's just some arbitrary border that the witches made. I don't know. Now, of course, I'm putting more thought into this than the authors did. 100% absolutely that is confirmed. But you already know it's a badly written story because you should never put more thought into it than the author did. That's just, like, a basic rule of writing, I think. But my point is, if going too far in the world causes the world to, like, blow up because the titan titanium mines were, like, all destroyed because they went too far, why would the beloved Hexen Circle mages not put up some kind of barrier to keep them from going so far so that the beings they create don't destroy the world that they made for them by accident did the witches just not care did the author just not think about it i mean it raises a lot of basic logical questions about how this magical world functions or even exists also i don't know why when the origami animals go to the real world they become real animals like is that something that one of the mages from the hexen circle just coded into the book like basically put in some computer failsafe. like if you cross the barrier to devot you become flesh and blood because paper animals couldn't live in the real world but like that's literally proven to not be true because back in labyrinth warriors there's that paper guy who exists in the real world and he's sentient and he just floats around no problem and he can totally exist in devot as a sentient paper being so i call bs on that why did they turn into real animals it's never explained and just thinking about this is making me realize how terrible the story is like i know it's bad but sometimes when you attempt to put any thought into it and you realize just how quickly everything falls apart and how little sense it makes it's really just like cracking a raw egg on your head you're just like wow they really put no thought into this they actually just wrote random shit down I actually have a personal headcanon that every summer event past the first one is written by the Hoyaverse writer's children. Like, they have a bring your children to work day, and the kids just write the summer quest because that would explain how nothing makes sense. There's talking animals, toy men, Lego dragons. Like, it would explain a lot. And that's my personal headcanon as to why the summer events are always so bad, but that's just me. So anyway, I was trying to explain to you how Simuloco worked, and we kind of ended up getting lost in the sauce, but that's just proof of how poorly explained it really is, and how poorly thought through it is, and if it is well thought through, then that isn't conveyed clearly to the audience. So because we know so little about the Simuloco world, and even its authenticity, authenticity for most of the quest like even at the end of the quest we have extreme questions i'm extremely confused and i feel like that adds to the thing where i couldn't really sympathize or get into the non-human characters because i wasn't even sure if they were real so like why should i care about them if they're just like toys or a dream or illusions or characters in a story i also had another quick point i'm going to bring up before we move away from how poorly explained simulanka itself is is basically they say a bunch of weird very vague confusing stuff about how durin the Durin of this world has a mirrored fate to his real world counterpart. Basically, I don't understand what that means. I assume it means that what happens to this Durin will happen to the real Durin outside. But the real question is, why is that? Why does only Durin have a counterpart inside Simulanka? Like, why is that a thing with only him? Why doesn't everyone in Tabat have a mirror of themselves in Sim Simulanka? That's never explained. They make a big deal out of this artificial world's fate being a mirror to the world of Tavat. But then again, if that's true, then why doesn't everyone else have a counterpart in this artificial world? Why does only Durin have a counterpart here? Where is Scaramouche's Simulanka double, or Nilu's, or Davalin's? Why is it only Durin? Like, that actually may have been way more interesting if they actually had, like, a fleshed-out idea of the Simulanka world being a mirror of Tavat and gave us artificial copies of, like, the playable characters that we know in Tavat. That could be kind of cool. And they could, like, invert their personalities or something and make them different and unique and possibly funny. That could be pretty interesting. But instead, we just get a bunch of pointless origami animals and toyman NPCs and one version of a character we have never even met instead. Bad writing decision. It's also, of course, a contradiction, because if this world is a mirror of Tavat's fate, then it must have a version of all the playable characters inside of it, since their fate is bound by the stars of Tavat. So, we are told repeatedly that Simulanka is a mirror of Tavat, but that can't be true, because it only has one being, Durin, who exists within Tavat, represented inside of it, not all of them. So, just some wonderful food for thought on that one. Let's change topics a bit. I've honestly hated the Hexen Circle stuff since it was introduced with a passion. I think all of the Hexen Circle mage stuff is, they're just so worthless as characters, and like Hoyverse doesn't even bother to animate them or give them designs. They're always just these disembodied voices. They literally have letters for names, like they don't even give them real names half the time. I've just always thought they were so lame, and they're basically just plot devices to make random magical BS happen so that Hoyaverse doesn't have to in, like, explain anything or put thought into anything because they can just say oh why is this happening because the hexen circle did it because of their infinite magic and i just find that really really lazy so i've never been interested in them and i've always just been annoyed with them because hoyverse just uses them as this really lazy plot device 
And I mean, literally, the majority of them don't even have names or designs. None of them have designs at this point. And I feel like it's really hard to get invested in a blob of empty space, a disembodied voice saying vague stuff you don't understand, and a single letter of the alphabet, like, not exactly top-tier character writing going on. Also, I just don't like the idea of all these witches being so powerful. Like, literally, it seems every single member of the Hexen Circle is basically at, like, god-tier power level. Like, these... There's, like, three of the witches of the Hex the Hexen Circle. That name is gonna trip me up a lot. Mentioned in this event, they just... The three of them made this whole fictional world. And every single being in that world, as far as we can tell, is sentient, capable of thoughts, feelings, ideas... The fictional world the mages created can be traversed by normal people from Tabat, and their creations can leave this pocket dimension, fairy book, whatever the heck Simulanka is, and go to the real world. Like, excuse me, what? Do the Hoiverse writers not realize how insane that is? Like, how powerful they actually made these women? One issue that stems from making characters of this power level is it's very difficult to come up with conflicts for them to deal with because they're basically in their fictional universe, they're demigods, and they can just do anything, so nothing can stop them. These witches literally created a whole world full of probably thousands or tens of thousands of sentient creatures and made a way for those creatures to come into the real world, allowed real people to come into their world. Also, their whole fictional world they made is like a mirror of the fate of the real world, whatever that means. So what conflict could you possibly give the members of the Hexen Circle that they couldn't instantly solve with their seemingly infinite magic? Basically, I don't like the idea of so many just super powerful people running around because I feel like it makes it really hard for there to be any stakes in the story. Because if you know, if any of these women ever become playable or involved in the story in a bigger way, there's basically nothing that could stop or challenge them. And I don't like that idea. I think that's a bad idea. I think it's better to keep characters more on the weaker side because then it's easier to give them conflicts that they can actually struggle through and overcome. It also keeps them feeling more relatable because like obviously no one can really relate to a character who can create entire worlds full of sentient beings on a whim. I mean, making Simulanka, as far as it's implied, is just something that these three witches did for fun. Like, this wasn't even, like, their life mission or something they slaved away at every day until they died. Two of these witches are just straight up alive. So it really comes off as they just did this thing for fun. It was, like, a passion project, but then they just kind of abandoned it. That's how powerful they are. Like, the feat of Simulanka itself... The Archons aren't even close to this level of power, like Zhongli, Venti, Raiden, Nahida, even, well, maybe Nervalette could do something like this because he's literally, like, so OP, it's actually ridiculous, with just, like, a thought. He can turn all primordial seawater into real blood, even though that makes no sense, and I talked about that at length on my why the fifth chapter of the Fontaine Archon quest was a crime against the written word video. But regardless, all of the normal Archons could never do something like this, and even Norvalette's feet is nowhere close to this. So it's like, it's just ridiculous, like, that's how powerful these characters are. And I feel like to even make characters at that power level is, I mean, it's like, it's kind of unthinkable. So like, they should never become playable or important because they will literally trivialize every conflict that could pretty much be invented like you would have to think of like you know reality shattering threats which I just feel like is ridiculous and I feel like we should avoid that for sure so to get back on topic a little bit these three witches made this whole artificial world all these sentient beings also, um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but just to, again, talk about how ridiculous the writers made them in terms of power, the witches didn't just create sentient life, but they made a world where anyone from Tabat, most likely, could create sentient life as well, as Nilu does when she makes the origami squirrel and speaks the magic words, and she literally just creates a sentient life form. And while not completely confirmed, I feel like it is pretty believable, it is pretty reasonable, I should say, that anyone from Tavat who enters Simulanka could create sentient life. Nilu just read some books in the fairy's house on how to do it, and so I feel like it's not an unreasonable assumption to think that others from Tavat could learn to do this as well. The witches basically made um, Simulanka this amazing, and like they're so powerful, and they made this crazy place on a whim. And then they kind of got bored of it and left. Like, the two remaining witches that live haven't been to Semyalanka in a long time, 
which implies to me that they got bored of it. That's how powerful they are. This wasn't even like something they were that attached to. They just did it on a lark pretty much. Also, I just realized it's incredibly shitty of those two witches that are still alive to just abandon Durin in this world. I think it's most likely that they knew about Durin's predicament from their friend. I mean, heck, they helped create this version of him in this world, I'm pretty sure. So I don't think you can attribute their negligence to ignorance. Basically, those other two witches knew that Durin in this world was suffering because he was alone after his mother died, and the other animals didn't understand him, but they never came to help him or try to give him comfort or give him guidance of any kind, even though they just knew he's been in here all this time just suffering alone. So that does make them extremely awful, and that does piss me off, but it doesn't surprise me because almost every single member of the Hexen Circle that we've ever heard about is basically evil, including Alice, by the way. She's done some incredibly heinous stuff, including, like, basically human experimentation on hilly trolls, because, like, the, the hilly trolls are just humans who have been contorted by the curse, and we know hilly trolls are still intelligent, they have feelings, they have their own language, um, like, so yeah, she's done really terrible things to hilly trolls, and so basically that's like, you know, human experimentation, so that's wonderful. And we know that Ryan Daughter, who's also like Alice's friend and also part of the Hexen Circle, literally killed her own children and would even force her other children to consume them if she thought that the ones she was killing were failures. So yeah, that's all very lovely. So every single one of the Hexen Circle mages that we've ever heard about is pretty much evil in one way or the other. So I'm not really shocked um, by anything at this point. Um, but I really do wish Hoyaverse would just kind of write the Hexen Circle witches out of the story and pretend they never happened because they were a huge giant mistake that I wish would just um, go away. Another thing I want to bring up real quick is that every single playable character here was abducted and it's not cute. So basically, if you don't remember, Traveler, Nilu, Karara, Navia, and Scaramouche are all brought to this realm against their will. And that's just like kind of insane. And it's like just kind of brushed off. But like, it's not like Alice kidnapped us. <laughs> like what? I just said she was evil. But like, yeah, she literally abducted us. Um, and like, you know, what if we were in the middle of something important? Like we were in the middle of an adventure. We literally just got sent a book in the mail. So what if Lumine was like on a commission to like save somebody from like a monster and then she touched the book and then she's like literally trapped in this realm for like days, weeks, we're not sure. But, and that could have been true for like any of the others, maybe not like a life or death situation, but like Nilu could have had a big performance. Like she has like, these people have jobs or like Karara, Navia like they have things to do in their lives and like Alice just abducted them without their consent which is just crazy and it's like funny that they just like kind of brushes off I'm like hello like it's not even just normal abduction it's abduct it's like abduction to a different realm where you don't even know like if you can leave or how to leave it's like just absolutely horrifying if you think about it for like three seconds and I feel like the lighthearted tone of the quest it would have been better served by just having us willingly consensually go to this realm instead of making it an abduction so like that was fucking weird and I hate that um Scaramouche was the only freaking normal one because everyone else is just like um well Nilu and Karara do seem a little freaked out Navi is like whatever abduction's not a big deal I'm like what the but, like, Scaramouche was the only one who was, like, trying to look for a way to leave. I'm like, huh? Like, if you were teleported against your will to a different dimension, and this different dimension had nothing you knew or understood without your consent, and you never knew if you would see your friends or family again, like, or you cared about anything else back in your real life, like, yeah, you would be, like, freaking out and searching for a way to leave. So, like, that's the only normal. So, Scaramouche is the only normal one. Everyone else is kind of weirdly chill about it. This is something I just, apparently, I felt like I need to inflict on you. I just wanted to let you know that the Toy Men poop. This is, <laughs> they eat and poop. And I just found this really horrifying because when I first saw them, I'm like, oh, you know, they're made of plastic or whatever, wood. So, like, obviously those, they're, like, made by magic, so they don't need to, like, consume or produce waste. But um, in Karara's little side story thing, they say, like, they talk about toilets and, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, inflict that mental hazard on you so that you would know that the Toy Man poop because I have to know about it because Hoyaverse 
just made sure we knew that world building detail. So, you know, don't explain anything important, but the Hoyverse writers are like, you know, but make sure they know that the toy men use the toilet. So lovely. Love it. Just phenomenal writing right there. Um, so another complaint I have is basically the story structure is completely whack and the real story of the the fourth summer event doesn't start until chapter three or act three of the event. Um, because if you like if if you were to boil down the story, it's like what is the conflict? What is like what are we overcoming in this event? It's like we're helping Duran to be less ugly. So basically yeah so the story doesn't really start till chapter three and the first two could have just been skipped entirely they're like there's nothing really that important that comes or is like explained in them we barely talk about the dragon at all even though they could have used that as a chance to like foreshadow his goodness but like they didn't they just we just fart around basically like so those are just pointless and they just waste our time so those definitely could have been way better done and I I love it when Hoyaverse wastes my time it's just that's like that's the reason I keep playing the game actually it's just so they can waste more of my time so um this kind of has to like go along with a little similar thing um I just said like one of the ways they could have made the first two chapters less useless is to actually like introduce foreshadowing of the dragon maybe secretly being good or misunderstood or blah 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 and like this kind of comes into how we do learn that so basically the way we learn that the dragon is actually good is through just seeing his memories and I, I watched this this youtuber named Mahler and he does like long form media criticism and he talks about um Doctor Strange um Multiverse of Madness and the reason I'm bringing this up it's important it's relevant okay is he talks about this scene where like Doctor Strange and the girl tag along are walking down the street and they basically like the author's like how do I make them talk about their past? And instead of like being creative or natural and like like remembering how normal humans have conversations, they just like walk and they land on this little like puddle. It's not a puddle, it's like a button. And then it like this memory store because they're in this like fan magical realm, whatever. It starts playing their memories, okay? And Mahler, the YouTuber, just talked about how much, like, this is just hack writing, right? It's literally lazy. It's like, how do we le- get them to see their memories? Oh, just, just, they go to the memory store. That's, like, literally what happened here, except there's no store. But, like, the authors were like, how do we get them to sympathize with Durin and let let them know that he's had a, oh, let's just have him, them see his memories. And, like, they don't even really explain why. It's just, like, we're just seeing them now. Be- I don't even know why. I can't tell you. I think it's, like, magical smoke. I don't know because they don't They don't care. Like, they <laughs> they did not care to give a real explanation. And there is a lot of other just kind of lazy um, things they do in their writing. And one example is the book just teleporting us there. Um, again, there's no buildup or, like, introduction of this idea of this, like, fantaco fantastical world it's just like oh we just touch the book and we go there like what and if you contrast that to the first summer event even the second one um basically the fantastical vacations they're given time to be thoughtfully explained and set up so you're not like oh what am I doing here or oh my gosh I was just abducted against my will without my consent it's more like oh this is so wonderful so like in the first event um, you know, we get the letter from the Dodo King and then like Klee where he's going to go investigate and then Jean and Barbara tag along and it's like it's set up, right? And we willingly go to the island. So there's like thought put into how we get there. The second one, like Fischl's having this vacation, you know, there's scenes where we invite the friends. Again, we consent to go there. So it's like it's set up. And then, and that's the author thinking like, I want to write this story where we're in a fantastical tropical paradise. How do I get us there? And like, putting effort into doing that but in this one they just take the most lazy approach it's like how do they get there oh they just touch a magic book and are brought there instantly like it's so lazy even the third summer quest which is the worst one it's even worse than this one um but even they put more of an explanation into the traveling to the fantastical part although the explanation was just terrible and it was pretty hackneyed it was pretty terrible but it was like at least it was something this is literally like oh we touch a book that just came in the mail like it's it's bad okay 
So we're gonna move on from that. So, so I wanted to talk about kind of Durin here, and I'm talking about Lego Durin. Like, I, I actually hate Mini Durin as kind of his name because I'm like, why should his name change because he's small? Like that just feels weird. So I'm just gonna call him Durin. Um, if that'd be like, if you like broke your arm and then Alice was like let's call you broken arm whatever your name is like it's just kind of fucked up I don't know but anyway um so the first thing I want to talk about is how I think that Durin like so the I can't remember what letter she is because I don't give a shit so like (laughs) the Hexen Circle Mage Durin's mommy she names him Durin okay And the other mage specifically tells her that if she does this, he's going to suffer like his real world counterpart. So like, like the name has power and it links you to the other one. And like my, I had talked to my brother about this and he was like, oh, that's why everyone doesn't have, um, a a copy or another version of themselves in Simi Lanka because it's like, they have to be willingly named the same name for their fates to link but I still I understand where he's coming from but I still think that's confusing because they repeatedly it's like a thing they repeat over and over again that Simulanka is a mirror of Tabat's fate and that's just not how can the fates of the two realms be linked if none of the same people or very few of the same people are in the respective realms like you know the fate of Tabat is going to be different because of all the people in it Right. And if, if Simulanka doesn't have those people, then it can't be a mirror. Like, that's just so that's a plot hole, I guess. But anyway, so in naming him Durin, he's going to suffer. Right. I think it's ethically questionable that the mage names him Durin because she's like, oh, I want the real Durin to have a better ending or whatever. But it's like, you're kind of like making this new being who's innocent suffer because. You're sad about a totally different person in a different dimension. And also, like, because this Durin, like, is happier doesn't necessarily mean the other one will be too, unless I'm misunderstanding how it works. But, like, the point is, like, she put Durin from Simulanka through so much stress and pain and loneliness. I mean, he literally, like, basically has suicidal thoughts by the end. Um, and then, like, you know, he, now he's all good and friendship saves the day and, you know, fixes mental illnesses and stuff, which is great. And none of this would have happened to him. Like, he wouldn't have had to endure so much agonizing suffering if the mage had just gotten over herself and named him, like, Bob or Nathan or a, literally anything. She could have named him Hashtag and he would have suffered less, although – Undoubtedly, he would have been bullied by the origami animals then, but whatever. The point is, in naming him Durin, he kind of has to suffer for the sake of the other Durin. And I'm just not sure that's um, morally right to put that on, like, an like an innocent baby, like an infant, to be like, you're going to suffer for the sake of this person you've never met, who's already dead, by the way. It just, like, it just seems like unnecessary suffering, And I don't want my words to be twisted um, and turned into something wicked, okay? Like, obviously, if I'm pro-life, so if there is a baby in a mother's womb and the baby has deformities, I'm not saying, you know, kill the baby because it's going to suffer. Like, that's evil and messed up. But this is like, you know, a magical situation. And it's not like Durin was born and then it's like he's going to suffer so kill him it's like she chose to name him Durin and that specifically linked him to the suffering of the real Durin when she could have again named him anything else and he wouldn't have had to endure that so it's kind of like a better metaphor for kind of what I'm talking about or a real world equivalent would be like naming your kid Hitler or something because like it's kind of a weird example but sure but like And your kid is going to go through all of this bullying and like isolation and ostracization because of the name you chose when you could have named them anything else. And you knew that naming them that would cause them suffering, but you did it to make yourself feel better for whatever reason. Like, I don't know. So I just thought that was selfish and it's morally dubious to say the least. So this is also just like, one more thing I want to complain about real quick because I love complaining and also they make it too easy. Um, I thought there was a very weird lesson in this event. So basically like Durin 
is terrifying looking and he's like a lego dragon and he corrupts stuff he touches i think i don't know they barely spend like any time on that it's like a passing reference it's like uh this is so tiring (laughs) but like like that not this but them making the same baffling decisions over and over again it's like really just try like try harder like I sympathize with the writers if they were on a time crunch or Hoyvers did not give them a chance to um, have the time to make something good. But also, there's no way for me to know that was the reason and not that they just didn't care or they didn't put enough thought or effort into it. And it's like when you have a game this big and you have people that care about the story, maybe you should like, I don't know, try to make your stories good. Just a thought. Um. So one of the weird lessons of this quest is basically like if you're feared for your appearance, just change it. It's like really odd. So like Durin's ugly and the other animals fear him because he's horrifying and giant. So then like everyone uses the power of their blessings or words or it's unclear. I think it's the power of words. I don't freaking know. And then we make him into this like cute little Pokemon looking thing. And it's like, only once his appearance changes can he be accepted into, like, the other animals accept him. And I feel like that's kind of a little bit of a messed up message. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like if it was a Western text, maybe that wouldn't be the the message. I'm not sure. I'm not saying, like, all East Asian texts are like this. I'm just, I find it, it feels culture shocky to me. And again, I'm not saying every story is like that, but... I feel like it's kind of like if someone has a terrible scar and they scare people is the lesson should be they should just go fix it with plastic surgery and then people will accept them or should the lesson be that other people should look past their own prejudice and like get to know them as a person and realize that the out the exterior appearance isn't important compared to the inner person and I felt like that was kind of a little messed up or ill thought through. I don't know if that was the message they were trying to send. Um, But it's kind of like, you know, Durin needs to change for the other animals to accept him when it's like, you know, the other animals could have made an effort to understand him. Although you could argue like Durin didn't really try to communicate with them, but like he did at the beginning, we see some attempts of him trying to make friends, but they always like reject him or attack him. So it's kind of like putting all of, you know, it's like he has to change versus like them opening their perspectives a little bit. And it is made muddy by the fact that like, again, they randomly throw in there during like corrupts things he touches. So in that case, like he's actually dangerous to them. I don't know. It's all very kind of sus and weird. And I think again, kind of ill thought through. So that's just kind of something I want to put out there. And it kind of reminds me of like in the Fontaine quest when Farina lies to everyone for like 500 years, but it's presented as noble. And it's like, do I think Hoivers was trying to say that lying was uh, good? Not really, but do I think they didn't think through the implications of what they wrote? I think yes. And I think, again, that is such a big sin as a writer is to just not put a lot of thought into it. And I feel like there's some ideas in Natlin that are like that, that I don't really want to touch on here. But I feel like the Hoyaverse writers just need to really think through the concepts and themes they're presenting. They have a really wide audience. Lots of people are ingesting what they're creating. And so I feel like the least they could do is really spend time with what they're putting out and make sure that there are no immoral lessons in what they're creating. So I'm going to leave that there. So I can't really think of any complaints other than the ones I've already said. So I wanted to go over a few positive things I had to say about the event because, you know, less people say I'm not a positive person. I can't stand for that. Um, Being sarcastic. So a couple things I did like, and I'm like, you know, credit where credit's due, I guess, even though like this whole thing should not have existed, but whatever. We got to look on the bright spots. Okay, it was better than last year. So like, that's good. It was a low bar though. It was really low. But anyway, okay. (laughs) Wow. Even when I'm in my positive section, I'm roasting. But okay. So what I was saying, sorry, is things I liked. So one thing I like is that 
Scaramouche relates to Durin a lot. And um, I just like that that was one thing they put thought into is that like they have parallels. So like it makes sense for Scaramouche to empathize with him so quickly. Um, Even though I still think it's a little unbelievable to be honest. Like I already kind of expressed this. But at least there was an effort made to kind of connect things that happened in their life. Um, you know, Scaramouche, he's so autistic. He doesn't know the difference between someone dying and someone abandoning him. He counts them both as betrayals. Um, but just to nitpick, Durin's mom died on him and Scaramouche has abandoned him in an abandoned pavilion in the woods. So like, they're not exactly the same, um, obviously, but like, I appreciate the thought that the writers were like, okay, they're connected because they were both abandoned in one way or another. And again, I really wouldn't call it dying on someone abandoning them, but I could see how a child might view it that way. And um, it can kind of, you know, be misunderstood. Um, So I like that Scaramouche feels like a kindred spirit to Durin and he kind of sees his younger scared self in him and wants to help him. So like, I do appreciate some thought being put into their connection and explaining why Scaramouche wants to help him so much and why Durin becomes so attached to him specifically um, because Scaramouche was like his biggest comforter and supporter in the adventuring party, basically. Other things I like, the gag at the end with Kaya drinking ink is just funny as hell. <laughs> and that my boy Kaya got his contractually mandated cameo because my boy has a really good agent, we stan. If only Goro's agent tried, like, a fraction as hard as Kaya's, then maybe my furry boy wouldn't be stuck with sexual predator plot lines every single time he appears. But anyway, Kaya getting screen time, we love. And, like, is any event complete without Kaya? No. It's just an it's just an, an automatic failure if Kaya doesn't appear. So, you know, check. We got that going for it. It had something going for it. Let's get it. So another thing I liked was it's like a little tiny bit of bonus dialogue between Scaramouche and Nahida after you finish the pointless non-voice acted world quest thingy. That was a super cute interaction and like she is his mom and I love them. I also like the little detail of Scaramouche referring to the school as not a prison when the last time he mentioned having to go to school and being with Nahida he referred to it as a prison or rather to himself as a prisoner. So it's nice to see a callback to that line and it shows that his perspective on his current circumstances, his life with Nahida have evolved since we last saw him. Although, you know, it would have been nice to actually see his perspective and opinion change over time or at the very least be told why it changed. And yes, you can headcanon away your reasonings all day long, but that doesn't make it canon. But regardless, I still like that line and I just think their interactions are super cute and like I wish we got more of them because they're just adorable. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all the positive things I have to say about it. Like there might be a few others, but like For the most part, I think that's it. Oh, I also did like, um, they actually remembered like what they wrote about Scaramouche. I like the line where um, kind of all of Scaramouche's dialogue is pretty good. I just like think it's kind of shocking how nice he's being, but I think it's cool. I like when he hears that Durin's wish is to never have been born at all. He's like, no one should wish for that or you shouldn't wish for that. That's a stupid wish. He's obviously like self-reflecting and he realizes like his suicide attempt was a terrible mistake. And I just think that's so, um, I like that. It's like, he's grown, he's, he's healed some and he's reflecting on his life. So I like that. Um, and that he, you know, is able to, you know, tell Durin that, you know, that's not the answer. I also liked when it's kind of, it's kind of two references, but one is he's like, some people only listen after having the crap beat out of them. Basically, he doesn't say that exactly. I'm paraphrasing, but I like that. It's like just another callback to what happened. He only was able to change after he kind of hit his lowest point, um, after literally being beaten up in his robot suit. So Another thing I liked was when he goes on his little rant, when he's like, everyone with eyes can see that, you know, you just want to have friends and be accepted and blah, blah, blah. And then like, he's like, or, you know, at least like, you know, that will accept you for who you are, or at least accept your apology. I really like that. And it's very clear he's talking about himself as well as Duran, especially the apology line. I like he kind of looks down. Good liked that so that's it if you're like why didn't you say anything about the girls what's there to say they're so freaking boring like maybe if you're a guy you have like 
50 pages of dialogue about how Nilu Carrara and um, Navia's writing was just brilliant in this quest, but like doubtful. What would you say? Um, so anyway, I have nothing to say about them because they're boring. Um, if only maybe Shenha had been here or Ula or one of the female characters that actually has depth. And then maybe I have things to say about them. But um, yeah, I have nothing really to say about them other than what has already been said. So that's it. I think we're going to go ahead and end the video here. Um, thanks for watching this far. If you did, I really appreciate it. And go ahead and check out some other Genshin videos on my channel if you like this. If you like hearing me complain about Genshin, I got lots of stuff like that. Um, but if you don't, then that's fine too. Thanks for watching the video. And I just hope you guys all have a great day. Know that Jesus loves you. He died for you. The God of the universe literally died for you. And you're so special and precious. And just know that if you're going through something or you're struggling, you're in pain and you're just, you're not having a great time and you've been looking for a sign that things are going to get better, that you're cared about, that you're loved, that God is listening. Here it is. Um, you are loved and you're going to get through this and you are loved and you are cherished and you are cared for. And, you know, just take it easy on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Um, we're all trying and we're all trying our best. And it's like, you just got to be kind to yourself and you got to be patient and, you know, just know that you are loved and you're loved so much and um, you're not alone. So I love you guys and I hope you have an amazing day or night. Um, and I hope you just, anything you're going through right now, any struggles, any fears, any anything like that, um, I just hope it all gets better and know again that God is with you. Jesus loves you. If you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior, just reach out to him at any time and Jesus can save you. So I love you guys and I hope you're all doing well. And yeah, I will see you sometime, maybe when I feel like making another Genshin video. So I'll see you guys again and I love you. I hope you all are well. Bye.